Uh, good evening and welcome to the Vilnius Jewish Public Library. Uh, tonight we are honored to have here Professor David Katz, who will give us a lecture on cultures of the Litvaks. The New York-born Litvak himself, whose roots are from Shvinchan, after graduating Columbia University, settled in Britain to complete his doctorate on the origin of Yiddish. Uh, David uh, founded and for 18 years led Yiddish studies at Oxford University and in 1999 Professor Katz moved to Vilnius where he introduced Yiddish studies at Vilnius University and was their professor for 11 years. David is the author of a number of books, some of which we are honored to have here in our Jewish library. Professor divides the year between Vilnius and north of Wales in the United Kingdom. Recently, he is a rare guest here in Lithuania, so it's a, it's a great honor uh, for us to catch him during his visit, and we look forward for this interesting lecture. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Oh, well, yeah. I want to thank Liana for this very gracious invitation. Is it okay if I talk in New Yorkese? You know, now certain politicians in America make it a very prominent dialect, so I can. Yeah. They always say, what does um, 18 years in Oxford and, and whatever, 30 more in this part of the world do to a New York accent? I hope nothing, but there we are. I want to thank Rihanna. She's a very courageous, courageous director of the library. I heard that this cat's guy is controversial, and she says, wait a minute, so bravo, thank you. I'm honored to be here. Um, we are all very sad, and we mourn the loss of dear Zhilvinas Belauskas, who put in so many years of dedicated, hard work, effort, and incredible outreach, as we call it, to all corners of the world to make this library a bigger institution than a collection of books. And we're very shocked and saddened by his untimely uh, departure. Because it's my first talk here, I do want to say something about another um, spiritual founder of the library, Wyman Brent, whose collection formed the basis of the library here. Um, in the late 1990s, I met a man from California during one of my trips to Vilnius then. He was my height and half my weight, and um, he said he's a Christian Baptist from California who had a vision from Christ that his mission in life is to build a fantastic library of books on Jewish history, culture, philosophy, religion in the English language and for it to be in Vilnius so new generations and for dozens and for hundreds of years would come to the Jewish heritage via English. Now, we of course in the late 1990s thought, no, you meet many eccentrics. I too suffer from Vilna syndrome as the psychologists call it, an amazing attraction and love to this city. But when he turned up a decade later with 20,000 books, we stopped laughing. And then there was the long drama of the library, which is a topic for another evening. Our topic today is Litvaks, or as we call it in Yiddish, Litvakes. Any Litvaks here? Raise your hand. Yeah. Uh -huh. Thank you. There are many definitions and there are different cultures of the Litvak, which is the whole point today, that none of us own it, okay? And what we will come to all that. I want to thank Get uh, Professor Gedra Bersonite, who for years has been doing the uh, maps and charts for, I think, till now about seven of my books. So anything that's beautiful and professional is her work. Thank you, Gedra. Um, Let's start with stereotypes. Everybody says stereotypes are not fair, they're prejudiced. That's true. But when they come from the people themselves, and they last hundreds of years, no, there's something to it, okay? Not directly, indirectly. Some of the Jewish stereotypes about Litvaks, way too honest, even when it hurts themselves and others. There's times in life when it's better for yourself and the universe to shut up, no, the honest Litva, oops, 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 where am I? Dominica will save me if I completely uh, destroy everything with my non-technical nature. Um, so the Litva is honest in not always a constructive way is what the folklore is saying. Second, too much study, books, love of argument 
A litvak would rather win the argument and lose the case and lose whatever it is, his house, his money, his job. He has to win the argument. So this is another very deep, deep stereotype. I learned a lot of this during the 30 years of expeditions to find the last litvak in the land of Lita, which we will come to. Uh, perhaps there's a map there. Oh, there's a map. Oh, wow, even in color, thank you. So, okay, we'll hand that out in a minute. So, um, Lita, of course, covers all of today's Lithuania, Latvia, Belarus, and uh, certain big parts of eastern Ukraine, northeastern Poland, and more. So a lot of these definitions come from the, um, well, the border areas, okay, what's today northern Ukraine, southern Belarus. Um, lacking sense of humor. If you tell a Litvak a joke, he doesn't know, he cannot understand it. So whenever someone starts telling me there were two guys in a boat, they wanted to know, I don't know when to laugh, and I'm going to laugh at the wrong point, and like an idiot of myself, so I don't laugh at all. That doesn't mean the Litvak doesn't have humor. The Litvak has the satiric, biting humor, and the certain humor of the ridiculous, which often has to do with opposites. You say an opposite because you don't want to say the point. That would have to be a topic for another evening. Um, um, in Freud's famous, uh, I saw a number of books on Freud here, so I'll just remind you, his books on jokes in their relation to the unconscious, most of them are based on Polish, a southern uh, Yiddish humor, but there's a certain Litvak component there, even if he didn't know it from wherever he came in, in Malaysia. Less all believing than others. A religious Litvak believes in the Torah and the creation of the world just like anyone, uh, any other religious Jew. But beyond that, nothing. Someone said something happened. How do you know it's true? What's the evidence? Uh, let me see the evidence. I want to see the evidence. So the Litvak is a skeptic by nature, sometimes about very important questions in life, and sometimes well, it just doesn't particularly you know, you know, help. Less worried about heretical ideas, we will come to the 19th century in Vilna when many of the Maskilin, the Enlightenment proponents in Ukraine, who wanted to uh, revive the educational system, they were working uh, in cahoots with the Tsarist government to modernize the Jewish schools. No Ukrainian Jewish publisher would touch them. They came to Vilna, where the family Rome and its great publishing house didn't care. We publish a book, and the next year we publish a book by the other side, trashing the book. It, that was not only clever business, it was intellectual damning. Okay? So not to, get a, not to worry that somebody's going to spoil my belief if I listen to him, okay? Um, except about Hasidism. When it comes to Hasidism, we are completely irrational, and I will explain later why. Okay? Or if I don't, you'll ask me any questions. Um, not so good at business. Now, there are several sides to this image of not so good at business. One is a repeat of earlier stuff, that you know they're afraid that the, the, the great Ritvish Rov of God in the Chofetz Chaim in the late 19th and early 20th century, he wrote an entire tract on how not to cheat your customer by mistake, by the scale being a little bit off, especially if it's a non-Jewish customer. If you're obsessed with that all day, you're not thinking about how to grow the business and like that. But there's a deeper folklore here. The folklore is that the Litvak is poor because the North, Lithuania, the Bulbenael Fundarite, the potato earth, the Bulbene in uh, Bulbene in Vilna and Bulbene in Posna, um, earth of Lit and the image was that the black earth of Ukraine gives the most the great riches and, and provides the grain and bread for the world. So there was certainly that. Less fun, okay? Litvaks are difficult people. That's the same. <laughs> okay? Lacking in emotion, a kauta, putin, and litvak, that where other people cry or laugh or get hysterical, they just say, hmm, are they Okay? Stubborn as nails. So this image of the Litvak is, hey, I decided already. What do you mean you want to talk about it? I decided. It's my decision. You want me to, you want me to be a fickle person who changes his mind every day? So stubbornness is another folklore. And then these traits, like I say, folklore is important. It's not truth. It's not meant to be truth. But it's not a lie either. Okay? It's folklore. Um, okay. The definitions of Litvak, who is a Litvak? 
the full-fledged Litzvah has to be the native speaker of Yiddish in the historic sense, okay? And the, the dialect of Litvish, of the Lithuanian Jews, is so different from the dialects of the South that if you open your mouth in the Yiddish language and in pre-modern or traditional communities today in Ashkenazi Hebrew, in one minute, you know if it's a Litvak or a Southerner. Every stressed vowel almost is different. So if I am Dovid in Vilna, I would be Duvid in, in Warsaw. Um, if a girl is Dveire in Vilna, she'd be Dvoire in Warsaw. The holiday here is Purim. Down south it's Pirim. We drink wine, not van. The holiday is Pesach, not Paisach. Uh, to have a habit is a Teva, not a Teva. So these correspondences cover thousands. So, there are very many stories, including in my own family, when they emigrated to America in 1920, one of the happiest childhood memories was the one day in Warsaw, spent before the next leg of the journey uh, to, to um, the Netherlands, uh, for the boat to America, and they would hear Yiddish in Warsaw and would laugh hysterically, okay? I remember in Brooklyn I had two aunts who would always have a terrible fight at our Passover Seder. The Passover Seder is for the Jews, like Christmas for the Christians. It's when you see all the relatives who don't want to see each other. And my father kicked me under the table and said, do something. And so I, st I was studying Yiddish psychology, and I started to speak in Polish Yiddish. And they started to laugh hysterically and forgot about the fight. So it, it, it worked. Um, now, very importantly, except for Dveire Dvoira, a oi. All the other vowels of Litvish are standard Yiddish, and they were standard Ashkenazi Hebrew for at least 400 years. There are many reasons for it. One is the prestige of the Jewish Lithuania in scholarship. There are also many coincidences, if you believe in coincidences, that the Lithuanian pronunciation is one to one more or less with the writing system, which only has vowel qualities, not quantities, all kinds of reasons, closer to source languages, whatever. You can tell I'm a Litvak because I left out the Litvak consonant rhythm, which has been the, the great shame of the Litvak to confuse sit and shit, a sounds with a Boston with young Yeah, So the traditional Litvaks in most of Lithuania collapsed sit and shit as one sound, but people from other dialects didn't hear it as a collapse. They heard the wrong one each time. So Shabbos, they heard it as Shabbos. Okay, okay, so that is the one um, stigmatized. And within Lithuania, if somebody became a, a teacher, a rabbi, he avoided that like the plague and was you know, certainly merit studying that. Okay, and then there's a geographic um, um, definition. North of a certain line is where the dialect features come. Now, I know that we, we linguist philologists talk too much about language and dialect. Language and dialect differences, when there's a border, it's never just the language. It's a hundred other things. The folklore, the beliefs, the connectedness, how you cook things, how you see the world. So it's a very wonderful, quick marker when everything changes at a certain uh, dialect. Okay? Now, there's a religious definition that is today very prominent followers of the Gaon of Vilna in Jewish religion, non-Hasidic, okay? So a few years ago, I visited my very Hasidic friend in a Hasidic town upstate New York called Muncie. Entire streets that speak only Polish Yiddish, but there's a small part of the, the town that um, they are not Hasidim. They speak English, so they're not. And they wear, their yarmulkes are in between. They're not the tiny the naked one is in the modern orthodox, but not the proper yarmulke. And they, in town, they are called the Litvish. So if you say, I'm a Litvish there, okay, it means in a non Hasidic plus orthodox, non Hasidic, <coughs> it has a whole new definition, and we academics have no right to tell thousands of people who use the word that they are wrong and we are right, okay? So, but it has lost a lot in the sense that some of these guys don't know what this is, where Lithuania is, okay? They just know they're not Hasidim, they're Orthodox, and then they're Lithuanian. The so that's the current Okay? Oh, I have to point this here, yes? Okay, we have to go back a thousand years to get a little more serious about the story. 
So a thousand years ago, the near eastern center of Jewish life in Babylonia collapses. All kinds of reasons, his um, milit uh, invasion, uh, changes in uh, Islam, changes in tolerance, all sorts of stuff. And by a miracle, at the same time, there's a bunch of new Jewish culture areas in Europe. And in the rabbinic writings of the time, these are the Jewish cultures of Europe. In other words, the Jews immediately had their own ge geographical concepts for Europe that correspond with the states and, and the national cultures and languages, but have their own ever different, ever differentiating nuances. So in the Iberian Peninsula, for, uh, today Spain and Portugal, Sforad or Sfar or Sfarad, um, and in, in the French-speaking area, Sorfas. Now, where did they get these names? They never existed before in that sense of Spain and France, okay? It was playfulness and humor. They founded the Bible. It's in the book of Jeremiah and also in Albadia. There's one stanza in a poem about what God will do to the peoples of Sfarad and Sorfas and to the Jewish ear, Sfarad, Hispania, Sefer, Ah, Sfarad, Francia, Sorfas, Francia. Even better, that passage in the Bible makes clear that France is to the north, that Sorfas is to the north. So perfect, those became the names. In Hungary, they couldn't find anything in the Bible, a place name that sounded like it. So you have to start looking at women. When everything gets said in life, you have to start looking at women. Abraham had a second wife, a concubine, called Hogor or Hagar in, in modern Hebrew. And so they called it Eretz Hogor, Hungary. Okay? So um, now in the first generation, all this meant the non-Jews. Sephardim were Spanish, and Sorbassim were Frenchmen, and Hagarim were Hungarian speakers. But by the second, third, fourth, we don't know, that became the name for the Jews in these countries. The Sfarim, the Sofasim, the Hagorim. Uh, in the case of Yovon and uh, Turkey, uh, Greece and Turkey, they actually found in Genesis chapter 10 in the Table of Nations after the Great Flood, you find that we learn that Yovon and Togermo, Togermo are, are Greece and Turkey. All of this area, was called Canaan. Okay, now this is not Canaan, the land of Canaan. This is Canaan, no, Vera, uh, someone who was called Canaan. Um, you may remember the story in the Bible that the great flood with Noah, yeah, yeah, and what do you do if the whole, uh, the whole world is destroyed and you survive? You throw a drunken party with the Chayans and fun. So Noah made a big party and he got drunk and he Whatever he did, he did, but he got objective, whatever he did. And the, the, he had three sons, Shem, the classic uh, patriarch of the Semitic people, Japheth, Yefeth, the father of the Indo-European people, and Ham, the father of the African people. So it says in one passage that Ham looked at his father's nakedness. In another, it said that it was his son, Kenahan, that looked at his father's nakedness and was cursed. Uh, forever to be a slave unto his brethren. And I remember even in my own New York youth on television, Southern teachers would say, ah, it says in the Bible that they're supposed to be slaves. So, yeah, so anyway, the, the source of the name is more from Bohemia and the Moravian land, things that ended up in the Czech countries, um, that was the center of the slave trade. So slave and Slav are related the same way in many European languages. So the Kna'anim were Jews in the Kna'anic countries. Okay. We finally come to the largest area in terms of people, Ashkenaz. Ashkenaz, if you look in Genesis 9 and 10, Noah had three sons. One of them was Yefeth, Japheth, and Japheth had a son, Gomer, and Gomer had a son, Ashkenaz. So it's in the line of the Indo-European peoples. There's a lot more to it. If anyone is interested, I can uh, send you a paper on this. Um, Many uh, in the in Talmudic debates, there's all kinds of legendary material um, of a Germanio that is somewhere and that has something to do with this same family line from Ashkenaz. Um, 
and it comes from the Aramaic word garmo, which means bone, and if it means bone, it also means white, and the Talmudic literature tells us because they were very pale skin, unhealthy, you know that, the pale skin that northern Europeans had that uh, had. Now, Ashkenaz and Sforad are the only two survivors today. The others are forgotten unless you study this kind of stuff. So let's talk a little bit about Ashkenaz. Around the year 1000, a little bit, and then in the next 100 and 200 years, Ashkenaz became the world center of Jewish law, jurisprudence. Rabbeinu Gershom Moya HaGoylo, or Gershom is considered the symbolic father. He issued edicts that were very novel in Judaism. For example, you can only have one wife. That's very anti-biblical. Whether it's Abraham or Moses or David or Solomon, you find me somewhere where there was one wife. Um, historians today say it was an accommodation to the Christian surroundings. But whatever it was, another one of his um, edicts is very painful. If somebody was forced to be baptized to save his life and then return to Judaism, you must never mention it to him. And the third edict is today still the source of humor. You may not ever read one word of a letter addressed to someone else. Okay? And so if, if we want to write that something is private, in Yiddish or in Hebrew, in educated modern Hebrew, you write Bechadrat. Bechadrat, the Jews love acronyms. Bechayim de Rabbeinu Gershon. This letter is under the ban of Rabbeinu Gershon. It's only to be read by the recipient. Okay? Um, so Ashkenaz became this world center of rabbinic Judaism. Sfarad, on the other hand, became the world center of Hebrew poetry, of philosophy, of philology, of many much more worldly universe, very different civilizations. And both were destined to survive because they were destroyed in their own country, and the exiles maintained them in many, many other countries. I have to point this here. In Ashkenazic civilization, Yiddish is the only spoken language. Nobody spoke in daily life any other language. But that does not mean that Hebrew and Aramaic were dead languages. They were not. First of all, um, everybody uh, learned the prayers and many parts of the five books of the Torah, the first five books of the Pentateuch. So there was incredibly much study of Hebrew. And more learned males went on to study Aramaic, which is the language of most of the Talmud and the Kabbalah. Um, but more than that, throughout the history of Ashkenaz, new works were being written in both Hebrew and Aramaic. So if people are writing new books in a language, it ain't a dead language. It's not a vernacular, okay? Um, but it is a very living language in another way. And there is also a societal difference. Yiddish is universal. The most simple person mm -hmm. and the greatest rabbi teach only in Yiddish, but... Um, the same rabbi who would write a personal letter in Yiddish uh, would write a um, commentary on the Bible in Hebrew and a commentary on the Talmud of Kabbalah in Aramaic. And they are very different languages, although related. Okay, so it's not the same. They, they, they never jumbled in, into one language. Um, okay, so aspects of Ashkenazic Jewry, which was universal until the modern period, when you have the various revolutions we will come to. It's Torah Judaism, as it's often called. Now, the word Torah can mean the five books of Moses on the scroll in the Bible and, and, the, and the, that you see on the Sabbath raised in the synagogue, or it can simply mean the text, because the printed book is called the Chumash, that says Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's the Torah. But the word Torah here doesn't mean that. It means the whole rabbinic Judaism, that's modern religious Judaism, concept that every word in the Torah was written by God, um, even when it said that so-and-so wrote this or said this, um, the, the heretic uh, philosopher Spinoza, who got himself excommunicated without even being a litra, he wrote, how can you say that it's all by God when it says itself that this was by this one and this was by that one? It's a belief system, it's a religion, that God gave the whole Torah to Moses on Mount Sinai, not just the Ten Commandments, as it says in the text, that every dot and line and, and word is meaningful and 
over thousands of years, um, great scholars interpret what it means in the law. Okay? So over thousands of years, they came up with 613 commandments, negative and positive, based on the Torah. The rest of the Bible, you could have a different opinion, John, but to be a Torah scholar meant that you are also completely conversant with much of the Hebrew Bible, the Mishnah, the code of law in Hebrew, codified around 200 AD, um, and the two Talmuds. So that's the Jerusalem Talmud in 400 AD and the main Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud in 500 AD. So if you look at a big volume of the Talmud, you find a little paragraph of Mishnah in Hebrew and then sometimes 10 pages of debate in Aramaic. Now, many people are shocked. They think that all this stuff is religion. But the Talmud is about civil law, marital law. There's a whole tractate on sex. There's a whole tractate on the Messiah coming, the, on the temple, how it has to be rebuilt. And a very, very large percentage, I don't know the percentage, is what we would today call jurisprudence, law. Okay, so the, um, this, there are three whole tractates, um, Boba Tame, Boba Nesia, and Boba Basta, the first gate, the middle gate, and the last gate, that um, all about the laws of damages. If a brick falls out of this window by mistake and injures someone, what is the liability of the landlord, of the tenant, of the guy in the street who it fell on? Did he have a chance to move? So it's a, and um, so that kind of lawyerly, lawyerly thinking, if that's the word, um, was very much in the Talmud. Then there's a very big mystical tradition, Kabbalah, that needs to be the subject of a separate evening. But I want to say it's in Aramaic, and uh, it involves a lot of philosophy. And like many philosophers, where did the world come from? Why do we exist? What is the purpose? And it has very many daring views. That is why in traditional Ashkenaz, nobody could study Kabbalah unless, unless they were a very learned male, sorry for the chauvinism that was there, over the age of 40, who had already mastered the Talmud. Okay? So it's not for going to some Kabbalah show and putting on some thing on your hand and being a Kabbalah. It's hard stuff. Now, what did the Ashkenazim believe? Besides one God, that's obvious, and besides the Torah, now that's obvious too. They believed in a religion that's not the Old Testament religion. In the Old Testament, you'll have a lot of trouble finding stuff about life after death or the Messiah, unless you interpret or believe something, whether Jewishly, in a Christian way, or in any other way. But post-Biblical Judaism, has the concept of the afterlife, just as Islam does. And this concept is hard to explain it now to modern people. I've been fortunate enough to know in my life, and I still do, proper religious Ashkenazim who've never been, they have not been ruined like us. And um, for them, the world to come is every bit as real as the sun and the moon and the morning and the evening and the, the autumn and the summer. Okay, it's just, and that the future Messiah will come. And some of you may know there are two very similar religions, Judaism and Christianity, the same Messiah from the same root, David Boaz, and, and one of them says he came already, and he'll come again, and the other one says he never came, and he's going to come, and that will come into the great tolerance of the Grand Duchy that we are coming to, but we, we have to get there. Okay, um, in the Middle Ages, when confronted with convert or die, um, the Ashkenazic ethos was, of course I want to die. I'm not going to be baptized. Uh, I'm going to die. I'm going to go to heaven and have eternal life in heaven. It wasn't a question. And um, this is very closely uh, tied with something a lot of modern Jews don't want to talk about, strict pacifism. You're going to kill me. Okay, I will go to heaven. I'm not going to take up arms to fight you. And there are very, very many Holocaust chronicles about the rabbi in the town preparing his people for the mass murder and, and preparing to be sure they can say the prayer before death. Um, complete pacifism, no arms. It wasn't America, uh, Second Amendment. And what is it? Something? You buy a 16 year old a gun for his birthday. No, 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 no. It was a completely pacifist culture. And the heroes of the people were the great scholars. So here I have to say a word about the word rabbi. When you think of a modern rabbi, it's not the right word for what these guys were. Do you have one? These 
rabbis were the intellectuals of the time who had that reading knowledge. They had to pass hard exams to get this degree, smicha, it's called ordination. And they were the intellectuals, the chattering classmates uh, of the period. And many of them were writers. And they wrote commentaries. They didn't like modern genres, novels, and so on. They wrote commentaries, super commentaries. That's a fancy word for a commentary on a commentary. And we have so many books that are commentaries on commentaries on commentaries on commentaries. And it's a huge literature. So it was very different from the modern congregational rabbi, which is part of the modern period and the model of Christianity in Europe. So that's, again, a whole different story. Um, it does mean that the Jewish heroes were all learned people, in some cases women, but always learned people, not someone with a sword. So um, in Ashkenaz, there was a counterculture that was not ordained or sanctioned by the rabbinic, by the religion, and that was Yiddish. So nowhere in the Talmud does it say you can't read a fun book. So from the Middle Ages onward, Yiddish literature developed first primarily as a literature of women, but of women and of most men who were not proficient in Talmud. I mean, it is very difficult to do an Aramaic text. Okay? And many medieval Hebrew books are, uh, sorry, Yiddish novels and epic poems, they are reworkings of European uh, epic romances. Teenage Artus Hay was known until about the, until around the year 1900, there was a saying in Vilna that he thinks he's in King Arthur's court, and he thinks he's a rich that he's important. In other words, the book had, li had a life up to around 1900, so to seven, eight hundred years being author in Yiddish. These books have a lot of humor. They, they use anachronisms. Um, so, and also, they were daring scenes of death and blood and damsels in distress and bulls over a woman. Um, so the rabbis didn't like it, but this was a development of, of the Jewish literature. Um, the most famous, or not most famous, the most successful development was the synthesis of East and West, taking the form of the epic poem okay, and um, connecting it with Jewish content. So if you remember the book of Samuel, the book of Kings in the Bible, it's full of bulls and Absalom's revolt and King David and Bathsheba. It's, it's classic nightly romance stuff. So you have the Shmuel book and the Melochim book, and you have all kinds of humor there, like King David had to stop to say the afternoon prayer, which is anachronistic, I guess, the Holy Shel Davenim Mincha, where there was no such thing in the time of King David, and the audience knew that, so it, they were sources of great humor. That was the counterculture. Okay, now, those of us who were lucky enough, like me, to grow up in one of the Christian majority democracies, whether it's the United States, Canada, Australia, Britain, Ireland, and New Zealand, and so on and so forth, we understand how Christ modern Christian dominant democracies are an amazingly tolerant, lucky phase in world history. There was a great Christian philosopher, John Locke, who came up in the 17th, 18th century with this amazing idea of separation of church and state, and so on and so forth. But in the medieval period, the Christian kingdoms of Central Europe were in intolerant of Judaism uh, to the point of mass murder. Not genocide, mass murder. The difference is that in mass murder, you can save yourself by doing something. Just get baptized and you'll be fine. So what happened in real life? More or less, and I'm whatever, I'm not being exact here, roughly a third of the Jews in Ashkenaz converted to save themselves, and many remained secret Jews, many didn't, okay? And now with the DNA test, very many people in Germany are finding out their percentage of Semitic blood and other stuff. Um, so that's a third. Another third went to their death in that spirit. I know it sounds like very little, but it's very much going to your death and to save yourself. All you have to do is say you believe something and, and you dump some water and you know, whatever. And the third third ran away. So where did they run? They ran to Eastern Europe. So we have to mentally conceive that Eastern Europe was then far more tolerant than Western Europe. Western Europe was stuck in that medieval 
dead menacing version of Christianity, okay? Where if you're Jewish, you must be a usurer, you must desecrate the wafer, you must kill babies for blood for matzah, and by the way, you guys kill Jesus in any case. In other words, it, it was no good there. In Eastern Europe, Christianity was either very new and weak or didn't exist at all. So the first great edict of tolerance came in the 1200s, Boleslav and Poland, and then in the 1300s you had Sardinia, and in the later 1300s you had, of course, a Vital, Vital Tassif, Edict of Tolerance, uh, with a 1388 for um, uh, Brisk uh, and 1389 for Grodno. The 1389 document is one of the most amazing documents in European history, hundreds of years before its time. Okay, so we Litvaks call Vito, Vitaltas, the Teirish von Lite. Teirish is the Lithuanian Yiddish pronunciation of Koirish, King Cyrus in the Bible. The Old Testament ends with a blessing of King Cyrus, the end of the uh, um, uh, Chronicles in English, it's called, um, the, 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 who issued this edict. I'll give you just one example from the text that if a Jew yells for help because a Christian, is attacking him, and his neighbor doesn't come help him, the neighbor has to pay a fine. In America, that got called affirmative action in the 1960s. But in, again, in 1389, this was like an unbelievable, um, you know, uh, saving, uh, salvation of a whole people. Um, it, it's interesting that one of the, uh, many things I'll say tonight are controversial, as I told you at the beginning, are controversial that Lithuanian multi-theism, okay, I don't like the word paganism because it has many negative contexts, is a formula for tolerance. If you believe in the sun and the kunas and the moon and the this and that, you're not going to kill someone. Oh, but the Messiah came once and he's going to come again, or he never came and he's going to come the first time. Ah. And from Gidimin onward, Gidimin onward, was this inviting people with skills and trades. Okay, so in, in Yiddish folklore, much about Gidimin, as we call it in Yiddish, um, is folklore. There aren't texts, but we have many, many stories, and some of them are based on, on real history. That the Jews couldn't get over that he sent away the Pope's uh, emissaries when they wanted him to convert. What? Someone could stand up to the Pope? Oh, so that, anyway. So we Litvaks often have, uh, right when you enter our home, portraits of Gidimin. So these were some of the roots of migration or fleeing, okay? Um, let's now turn to what was happening among the Ashkenazi. Around 1600, the Yiddish language had one of the largest spreads in Europe. Western Yiddish, three dialects that are now defunct, nobody speaks them. Northwestern Yiddish in the Netherlands, Northern Germany, Midwestern Yiddish was in Central German, Southwestern Yiddish in Elsass, in Lothringen, Switzerland, you have to be careful when you say nobody speaks them. In the early 1950s, a Swiss um, researcher of chemistry who happened to be Jewish and interested in her roots, Dr. Florence Guggenheim Greenberg, discovered two villages, Lendingen and en uh, Endingen and Lenau, uh, in Switzerland near the German border, where she found the last speaker of the Swiss Yiddish. But anyway, now it's really gone. I ran around in the, in the 1970s looking for the last Dutch Yiddish uh, uh, speaker. So anyway, that's Western Yiddish. Eastern Yiddish, the blue, that's the Lithuanian area. The rest uh, is the south, divided between, uh, to use the popular terms, Polish Yiddish and Ukrainian Yiddish. Um, there are different terms. So uh, academically, the Litvaks are northeastern. We're the northeastern of northeastern Yiddish. Okay. Um, in the 15th century, the word Lito, spelled this way, if you know the Hebrew alphabet, begins to appear. It appears for the first dated time in a letter by the great uh, 15th century uh, rabbinic author Iserlin, okay? Israel Iserlin in Germany. Um, those are just different fonts, the rabbinic and, and the square for Lita. Um, and um, from 1519 to 1764, East European Jewry in the Grand Duchy of Lithuania and the Polish Kingdom had the greatest degree of autonomy, power over their own life, since the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. It's quite amazing. It was organized into the Council of the Lands, 
sometimes called the Council of the Four Lands, but at times it was three lands, at times it was five lands, and Lito is one of the lands. Sometimes there's a separate land called Zamet, sometimes there isn't. Um, be that as it may, that's the Lithuanian area, okay? And um, its major cities were, and its great, its first symbolic capital of the Litvaks was a city the Litvaks called Harodne. It's Grodna or Gardinas. Um, Harodne was interpreted by the rabbis as meaning Har Adonai, the mountain of God, just the way Polanyo was interpreted as Polanyo, here God lands. In other words, the Jews never had it. It was how they themselves saw it. We're talking about history in the eyes of the people concerned, which is very different than our modern views and inclinations sometimes. Okay, um, Vilna was added in the, seven, in the year 1653 to 1687, um, where a huge uh, amount of, well, that want to get of money was put into bringing the best Talmudic scholars from all over Europe to Vilna. So the first generation were not born in Lithuania, they were brought. Um, now, the records of the council, the Pinkets, what they were published by Shimon Dubnov and then later by others, so when I was writing this book, Lithuanian Jewish Culture, I actually read the entire Pinkus or the Pinkosim to see if the Lithuanian one was really different from the southern one. And I found a number of cases. For example, I'm speaking from memory, so it won't be, it'll be a paraphrase. In the southern um, record of the rabbinic lawmaking in the council, this was real law because they had autonomy from the government. Um, if a poor girl getting married, doesn't have enough money for a fancy wedding, the community must provide the money for her to have the same type of wedding as a rich young lady. Okay, that's in the southern one. And then I looked in the northern one, and it said, it's a sin to waste money on fancy weddings for everybody. <laughs> you have to use the money to bring a better teacher from a further town to your town. So it's really a different, a, a really a, a different concept. And, and that's one of a number of examples which convinced me that a lot of it is true. I, said, I, I was also a skeptical uh, Litvak, well, Litvak and Brooklyn because it has the same image in American culture. Of, we don't believe in it. And yeah. um, so that is the map, and you all get the present today of. Uh, so now, the Litvaks were always a stateless culture. In fact, I came in 1999 <laughs> to establish the, to help establish the Center for Stateless Cultures at Vilnius University. What is a stateless culture? It's a culture that doesn't want independence. It doesn't claim that somebody took something away and we want this country. No, um, it wants freedom to be an autonomous minority. So the first thing you'll see about the Litvak conception of Lite, Jewish Lithuania, is that it's capital city from the mid 17th century onward, Vilna, rather than Grodna, but this would work for Grodna too, is in the middle where a capital is supposed to be, okay? It's not a couple of miles from Lukashenko, whatever. In other words, it's a different concept. So the, the non-state aspect has an importance. It means that whoever may win the next war and whoever won the last war, we don't care so much as long as they leave us alone, okay? Um, and the Aramaic phrase from the Talmud, Dino de Malkutro Dino. The law of the land is the law. We must obey the law of the land. We live in. Okay. Um, these are, uh, these are um, Roman character transcriptions of the Yiddish name using the Yivo system, where KH is H, SH is SH. So it's based on English. It's the Yivo system. Um, so one of the ironies of the whole story is that the only language congruent geographically to the Grand Duchy of Lithuania is the language that Jews call Litvish, Litvish Yiddish. Okay? So Litvish Yiddish is this area. Um, that's a map comparing various uh, versions of the Grand Duchy of the times of the Dominas, of Albertas, of Vitatas, and the, the specifics are for another day. The linguistic territory of Yiddish goes all the way to the Black Sea in this narrow strip that's not part of classical Lita. That's from the early 19th century settlers in Tsarist Russia. 
when there were very many projects to turn the Jews into agriculturally competent uh, people. And um, so one of the highlights of my 30 years on the road, looking for the last litvak, coming to a little town near Kherson that has had some long, horrible Soviet name I couldn't pronounce. I don't know what it's called now. We found the oldest Jew, Jew a magnificent woman in her 80s, and she said, our town is Naikovne. So it was Naikovne for hundreds of years until the Soviet. So that's colonial Litvish. I asked them, are you Litvaks? No. no. That, but I said, what language do you speak? We speak Litvish. Litvish. So that's that whatever you want to call it, a tongue, a protrusion. Okay, so Lita by the 17th century was suddenly becoming famous throughout Europe, not only Ashkenaz, but even the Sephardic lands. This is a typical case. So a book published in Prague in 1611 by a, a philosopher. So it's, it, it brags about the author, that the author, okay, is Yosef by Yitzchok Halevi, and he comes from Medinois Lite, Medinot Lita in modern Hebrew, the lands of Lithuania, which I argued in a paper, I hope I might or may not be, it is the Hebrew medieval rabbinic and later term for the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. Medinois Lita, the lands of the country, the state of Lithuania. Okay? The United States of Lithuania, Medinois Lita. Um, later, um, in the 17th century, you have a generation of scholars born in Lithuania who become internationally famous. And Moshe Rivkis is one of the most famous. Uh, he fled the war here in the mid-17th century. And when he got to Amsterdam, this very poor uh, rabbinically learned man was shocked that they were giving him a huge salary to correct for, the, for, uh, for pr publication. Uh, an edition of the Code of Law, the Shulchan Aruch. Being a Litvak, he couldn't um, just correct. He also wrote a reply, and that became his commentary to the book he was correcting, which became just as famous. He, when he was old, he wanted to die in his native Vilna, and he left most of his money with a bank to be given to a descendant who would one day be proven as a young man to be a great genius in Talmud, and that was Rebbe Liyobu, the Gaon of Vilna. So in Lithuanian Jewish culture, you can find the generations of, of how uh, the story of the Be'er HaGoyla, if the Gaon of Vilna had to make a living, he wouldn't have been the Gaon of Vilna, okay? He, was, he had this family trust, I think we call it. Oh, and finally, you see, I arranged this for a real Litvak to walk in <laughs> just when we were talking. We were talking about how uh, in the... Um, 17th century, that already Sforum were beginning to brag that the author is from the Dinois Lito. Thank you. He has saved us tonight. And I will introduce him properly when we come to this chapter. Um, okay, so the Be'er HaGoyle, Reb Moshe Rivkis, returned to Vilna um, after he had been paid so well in Amsterdam to do not only the proofreading, but the, and he wrote the commentary on the Shulchan Aruch and left that sum in his legacy for a future um, great-grandson, great-great-grandson to uh, be able to uh, study Torah all his life. That, of course, is the only picture of the Gaon of Vilna taken from life by um, a Christian, a Catholic student at what's now Vilna's University. Um, and it was a wonderful scholar, Zusia Efron, from Israel. And he came here in 1997 when there was a conference in the 200th uh, yard site of the Gaon of Vilna, uh, death anniversary. And he, um, and he told the whole story of how he made this copy from the original that was, of course, destroyed in the war and had that tradition of having been done from life by that young Catholic artist who was captivated by the idea of this great rabbinic figure that Jews from all over come to see, and this guy has, the, the great rabbi, has no time to see anyone. He can't even see him, because he doesn't leave the house very much, okay? So um, it comes to that. In the 18th century, Lita became the center of opposition to the Hasidim. You've all seen Hasidim, you know, with the white tights and the, and the long tails, and the, unlike us Litvaks who are completely conventional looking and that. The Hasidic movement was born in Podolia, 
in, in uh, now in, in Ukraine, um, in Oman, in Mezhibuzh, in, Vi in Vinitsa. And um, it was a revolutionary movement that came up with the idea of the Holy Rebbe, who is holy in essence of his having a direct line to God and his, his son or whoever is, replaces him, the holiness is said to go to genetically and, and that person, and for the Litva, this was horrific. It was anathema. You have to study. How many years do you have to study to get a Shemitah and Baran You have to study. You have to study. You have to know what you're doing. You can't just say, I'm holy. Mm. Okay, so the Litva couldn't stand. There are many other differences, okay? The, the, the prayer rite, the, the Nusach Ashkenaz, the prayer rite was replaced by the, not, the Nusach Ari or in the, the 16th century uh, Sapphic Kabbalistic version, or in the case of Chabad, of course, Alpin Nusach Ari, it's not even the Nusach Ari, it's according to. So the point I was trying to get to is it was not the age of the internet. And if this had been a story about a new movement in Podolia, I don't know how many miles or kilometers that is from here, maybe somebody knows, um, uh, Uman, Mezhibush, Vinitsa, those places, it, nothing may have happened here. But there were Lithuanian Hasidim up north, and in the early 1770s, they set up two little prayer houses in a suburb of Vilna. What is it called? Antoko. Okay? And if you read our, our ban of excommunication, the Cherem, a lot of things are shocking to, to, to modern people. Um, the accusations that Hasidim don't follow the traditional laws of times of prayer, and that they do somersaults, sich in ecstasy, that they drink and take substances to make themselves merry and happy because it's a sin to be sad, like the Lithuanian. Uh, anyway, on and on and on. And so after the ban of excommunication, the first one was 1772, there was this new sense of Lita, Litvak and Lita in the religious and philosophical sense. Um, and the, the most um, prominent and effective leader of the Lithuanian Hasidim was, of course, Shnei Zalman uh, of Gadi. Um, he was born in Liozna, by the way, Shagal city, but, moved, uh, but he, he moved his court to Gadi. Later, his son moved it to another town, Lubavici, uh, Lubavitch. Anyway, um, now we think of Lithuanian Hasidim as Lubavitch, but there had been many small courts Amdor, Chernobyl, Karlin, Lechovich, Kabenov, Kobanin, Slonim, they were all Lithuanian Hasidic outposts, all on the territory of today's Belarus. Which, um, in New there's many stories about all of these. Uh, in Amdor, in Dura, just south of Grodno, we were able to find the last Jew in the, in the 1990s and his 90s who remembered legends about how they were eradicated by the Misnagdim from Grodno and, and how the folklore of these stories lived on. In the case of a city called Pinsk, there's even a difference in the name of the city. Historically, Karolin is a suburb of Pinsk. It's the other side of the river. It's, it's part of the city. But in Yiddish rabbinic culture, Pinsk is the Misnagdik Litvak name for the city, and Karolin is the Hasidic name for the whole. Kedanov, what is that called now? Is that a gene? I don't know, it has a very strange name now. But um, in Vilna, before the, between the wars, there were 100. Kedanov moved to Baranovich. Yes, and Baranovich. And Sloni moved to Baranovich. Sloni moved to Baranovich. was next door to Baranovich. Right. But Baranovich had, um, had Litvak as annexed him? Or? Yeah, Sloni both. was the biggest city. Was both, yeah. But, so, uh, but Kedanov was also uh, active. In and in the Vilna, there was a Kedanov at Chloris. Up until it was one of the ten Hasidic prayer houses in Vilna out of 160. There were 150 Litvish Misnagdic ones. There's a slightly different right, or not so slightly, if this is important to you, of the prayers and a number of differences. Okay, so the, a new definition arose of Litvak. That a Litvak is a Misnagdic, is a non Hasid, and you also had it ethnically, ethnographically. The Litvak speaks differently. He says, Viteire, not Viteire. Purim, not Spirim, Pesach, not Pesach, and as we discussed before. Now, how did Southerners refer to us Northerners? Okay, so in many Hasidic communities, Misnagid is a terrible insult. 
I grew up in Borough Park in Brooklyn. When I was a child, half the, um, half the population were non-religious Jews, uh, secular Jews, the other half were Catholic. And I was about 11 when there was a big Hasidic invasion. And they started to call our family the Misnagdim. And I remember asking them, what's it? And they asked, the And um, so it means Protest, pro it means uh, opponent. Um, so you can call us Protestants, but we don't think we're the Protestants. We're the Catholics because we continue doing what was done before. They made the revolution. But all that is um, in, 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 in Yiddish folklore. They often call a litra a Tselem kop, somebody with a cross in his head. Tselem is a cross. So one definition or explanation is that the litra is, is less pious and more skeptical as we discussed a few slides ago. And another one is a litvach lexif in the lingen and the break to the gain desire. A litvach stretches out in breadth and in height to get to the bottom of something, obsession to know the answer, to study it. So that is the origin of Salem, or at least we like to think so. Okay. <laughs> now, the big revelation of tonight. What's this one? I'm the last guy in the universe without a mobile phone. The uh, Baron once said to me, I think, yes. Dovid, I know that officially you don't have it, but tell me. I don't have one. I really don't have one. I'm going to walk around with a macharite. Anyhow, um, the southerners came up with a, an insult for us northerners. Anybody know what it is? Litvak. Okay. So in the Yiddish language, and in some Slavonic, some languages, the stress suffix ak is always an insult. Afolyak a lazy person, a tzvu'ak, a hypocrite, a patrinyak, a horrible person. And there are other words that are not appropriate for such an elegant audience, and I will not refer to them. So what happened? We Litvaks embraced the insult, but we changed the stress, because it's only, it only sounds horrible when it's stressed, Litvak. And we became Litvak, Litvakers. So I often find it amusing when people who don't know that welcome this as the great center of Litvak. <laughs> oh, it's quite interesting. <laughs> um, so like many ethnonyms, right, names of people, it started as an insult right, and, uh, and it was embraced. Why was it started as an insult? Because they didn't like the northerners. Um, they regarded them as not pious enough, as too skeptical. After the Hasidic Revolution, they regarded them as um, heretics who don't believe in the Hasidic Rebbe. There were all kinds. They were two different tribes. If you look on their map, you have the map. And if you look at the map, I spent 30 years on that southern line to find the border of Lita and Troy. Um, and it was if, 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 uh, if the two fish? tribes. Hmm? Did you follow the fish? Yeah, yeah. so I, I said before that all dialect lines that are very stark. We, we said at the beginning that every vowel is different. Yes, that over is Dovid and Purim is Kimen and Purim is Pirim and Pesach is Pesach. It's never just language. There's everything, tradition, food, preparation of fish, and you built the fish, and there are many ethnographic studies of all the non-linguistic features. So the difference between Hasidim and Misnagdim is a central one, but it doesn't exactly follow the line because there are some northern Hasidim like Chern uh, Chernobyl, that one. Um, okay, so you, now you know the origin of Litvak. Uh, they called us Litvak and we became Litvak. That'll teach them. Um, and in the 19th century, you had the Musa movement, not to be confused with a Russian word that has an unfortunate meaning that's very prominent in the American presidential election. Now, what is it? Garbage, everything is garbage. Yeah, Musa. Um, Musa, Musa in, in, in the book of Proverbs and Mishlei occurs in the sense of teaching ethics, rebuking others to, um, to do the right thing. So Rebbe Yisrael Salanta, of course not born in Salant, but very many great rabbinic figures were named for the town where they became famous, where they studied. He was born in Jaca, he was got it. Anyway, um, so the story is, as a young man, he, he, he was approached in the forest by the Zundo Salanta, who I think was born in Salanta. And the ethics movement um, added a new component to Misnagdism, that it's not enough to be strictly religious and regard only 
um, the physical carrying out of commandments is important, that ethics is so important. The, the, the famous examples of someone who worried very much about the kosher food and, and every detail, but is willing, uh, would occasionally um, cheat someone in business, okay? Or someone else um, who would be very strict about some other law, but would slander other people mm -hmm. all the time. Y in Yiddish literature and in many, uh, in many chronicles, you have fascinating descriptions of Musanitis, as they were called, it became very strong in Western Lithuania, in, uh, in Samit and Genotia. And in the 1840s, in the decade that Reb Yistroa Salanta lived in Vilna, there were dozens of translations into Lithuanian Vilna Yiddish of classic Musa books from the Middle Ages, okay? And these are fascinating. The, the Musa Nitten, the, the melody of learning, is different than the Talmudic one. It's sad and, and it's reflective. And it's a culture of testing yourself. Did I do the right thing? Okay? And um, later it split that uh, one story about Reb Yisvar in, I think it was 1848, when the Tsarist government had set up the new Rabina seminar here in Vilna. It's on the corner of uh, Zabalna and, uh, and Trotska, so that is Pilimo and Traku. It's now, I think, a luxury apartment building. It used to be Kankan Pizza Express Corner. Now I don't know. Anyway, um, to give this new masculine uh, inspired fake yeshiva authority, the authorities demanded that he teach at least one lesson a week in Talmud, and Rabbi Yisroel fled Vilna never to come back. That's, it's better anything to die than to teach one hour in, in, in the Tsar's fake yeshiva. So it is, it is very strong. Very many, very much. I mention this as another type of litva that was very prominent before the war. Okay? Um, these are, this is a map of the yeshivas in 19th century Lithuania, color-coded. Blue, of course, is the traditional Misnagic Lithish ones. Red are Chabad Lubavitch, and green are Musa. Say so green tends toward, toward the west. But there were many cases of uh, bitter battles between the, 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 different, the different parties. And one of the um, folkloristic um, descriptions became that if you travel from the far west of Lithuania to the far east, and we're talking about Jewish Lithuania, now, not the modern state, you start with the very sad and solemn Musanikis constantly berating themselves and others for not being good enough. You come to the center, to the great Talmudic centers and yeshivas, then you go further east, and there are more and more Lubavitch and other Hasidim who dance in happiness and drink and make merry all the time. So you go from sadness. And there are very many. So these are three religious movements, that, and these yeshivas created an enormous body of permanent contributions to Talmudic literature. Um, different areas of Lita had their own names in Yiddish. The far west was Zamet, not exactly congruent to Jemaitia, but based on it. Okay, the east was Reisen, and um, so Vitebsk was in Reisen, and Salant was in Zamet, and they were all in Lita, in the wild sense of Lita. Okay. And there were others, Polesia, Labdal, and so on. Um, in the era of Haskola, in the west, there was a massive change. Western Ashkenazim disappeared, by and large, or to a great extent, as an ethnographic linguistic entity in the 18th century. They became German Jews of the Mosaic faith. Moses Mendelssohn and his people in Berlin wanted to create the new modern German-speaking Jew who could be a doctor or a lawyer or even at least an accountant, but would go to his temple on Saturday where the organ would play. And anyway, so... Sunday. It, hmm? Okay. Sunday. Not sa sometimes Sunday. Right? That was a machloikis between the reform movements. Absolutely right. And there are many stories of these guys coming to Eastern Europe to try to spread it. So Yiddish literature is full of descriptions of, they were called um, the Deutschen, we call it a Deutschen Rock. That meant a short coat, a German coat, short. So a Jew would come from Germany, or a Jew who was persuaded of the, uh, the Haskola, Haskala in Germany, would come to a town in Lithuania, Poland, Ukraine, and, and give a speech that you have to modernize and, and, and learn Russian and learn Polish, learn whatever, and, and, and stop speaking. I'm a sugar. It's crazy. What are they doing here? 
by the early 19th century that developed the East European High School, which was to modernize without assimilating, and that led to two great new literatures, modern Hebrew literature and modern Yiddish literature. Okay? And um, so, um, and Vilna became the center of part of it. It became the center of publication. Um, so, for example, um, uh, two Dobias Royal couldn't be published in Ukraine, so it came to Vilna to publish it, a, a modernizing book that attacked the traditional Jewish schools. So Litvaks were primary among one branch of the Jewish political revolutionary movement that became the Bund. And um, the pre, pre-founders of the Bund were the two Aaron's. Long, complicated stories. One of them ended with suicide over a young lady in America. We won't get into that today. That's for a history of Jewish socialism. Aaron, Aaron Lieberman, uh, who was born in Lune, that's not far from Pinsk, or Karlin, sorry, and Aaron Zundelevich, who was born in Sul, which is not far from here, but on the other side of the border, a little bit to the southeast. Arkady Krema was from Svensian, Svensionis, and um, his wife, Patti Krema, was uh, born in Vilna. Now, all of these guys, studied in that state yeshiva on the corner of Hilamo and Traku, or Zavalna and Trotskergat. And underneath the Talmud, or supposed Talmud, was a revolutionary pamphlet by Marx or by Engels, and it became the hotbed of revol- secret revolutionary activity. And, and finally, the Tsarist officials understood and they closed the Talmud. But Bundism had, was being established by these. All of these people, just like all the great original Hebrew and Yiddish writers, grew up religious, orthodox. Today we would call them Haredi, okay? So that was in their background. You read some of their memoirs and it's full of flowing, flowery Talmudic uh, language. So these were some of the early Bundists, but now we'll come to modern Hebrew and Hebrew culture. Um, Zionism as a political movement was founded by Theodor Herzl, a German-speaking Jew uh, from Budapest in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, who was certain that the language of the recreated Jewish uh, people in, Israel, in the land of Israel would be German, of course. It was Litvaks who came up with the crazy idea that you can actually revive Hebrew as a language that somebody speaks, okay? Um, this guy, Lazar Perelman, you may know him as Eliezer Ben Yehudin, was born in uh, Luzhiko, Lushki, not far from here, it's at the very end of Vilna Gubernia, the end of Vilna province, at times it was in Vitex province, and that ended up being in the folklore because everybody wants their roots to be in Vilna province. I've seen his site over that in my time. Um, so he had the idea that Hebrew would be spoken, and he's the father of the modern Hebrew language of the state of Israel, which is an enormous success. How many millions of speakers? Five, six, seven. millions of speakers, but not one Jewish family in the diaspora speaks Hebrew unless they lived in it. That's still zero. Right. So it's a huge success in Israel. Anyway, that's for another evening, too. It's very unfair to talk about the father of modern Hebrew and not the real creator, there the were mother. Some, there were some people in, in Israel who spoke Hebrew Only, But they didn't have a whole conversation about everything. I'm like, Melach, Yayin, Mayim, 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 Yesh. That's not speaking Hebrew. Okay. To be able to have a conversation about the most intimate things. It was Eliezer ben, uh, Lezer Kepelman being a Litva, decided he would marry, here I'm being very, what's the word, um, politically incorrect, so my many Israeli friends will forgive me. He didn't look for a woman he would fall in love with or was beautiful. She had to have the best Hebrew. He went around interviewing and in a village, in a town, also at the Vilna Gubern in Drisev. Drisev, he found the Jonas family where there was, the daughters had this incredible knowledge of Hebrew. Drisa is today Vert Nidvinsk, the Tsar, Ch- not Tsar, Khrushchev. I, I, you need a Lehavdom? No, no Lehavdom. Khrushchev changed it to Vert Nidvinsk because Drisa is similar to a very not nice Russian word. So in, even today in Belarus, Izvenike Drisa and in Yiddish, Binnechile Drisa. So it's, it's now Vert Nidvinsk, upper, uh, whatever, upper Dvinsk. Um, so the first wife, Dvora, Dvere, Dverke, was the first Hebrew-speaking mother in, in, in roughly uh, more than 2,000 years. And it wasn't easy, you know. Um, there are all kinds of legends and apocryphal stories 
all the wine was being spilled, but he didn't yet have a Hebrew word for faucet or tap, and so the wine was lost. But the Eingespachte Verachtender Liebwerk, he wouldn't give in. We're speaking only Hebrew. Anyway, she um, died of. Faucet is in the Mishnah. Sorry? Faucet is in the Mishnah. What? Faucet is in the Mishnah. What is it? Bebes, Pausa. But he didn't know the word. In the Mishnah of the Mishnah. That you should tell them. He didn't know it. He didn't learn it. He didn't learn in a proper yeshiva. Uh, that, that has a much deeper, Rabbi Barron's point has a much deeper uh, uh, aspect to it that the revival of Hebrew at the time was based on the so called pure biblical language, staying away from Talmudic language, which reminded him too much of Yiddish. But as it may be, she died of a stress related illness. And a Litvak is not going to abandon an experiment. So he traveled back from Palestine all the way to Drissa and married her younger sister, uh, Bela, who he should change her name, of course, Bela. You can't go around with a Yiddish name like Bela. He changed it to Chemda, and she became the famous Chemda ben Yehuda, and they pulled it off. They pulled it off. Yeah, exactly. um, talking about names. Hmm? Maybe you can tell me why Lithuania is the only diaspora that people have <coughs> Hebrew names here. Why only? Here? After people. Where else do people have Hebrew names? Poland, Ukraine. Yiddish. Polish, like which Russian. one? Avram. Yeah, no, last names. Like, oh, Sakhor, I'm sorry, absolutely. Here, sorry, when, where did, absolutely when did this happen that they yeah. hear this Hebrew name? When, um, name when, when name. surnames were being given, chosen, Litvaks oh, were much so more statistically late. likely so to choose. Later, 1860, 1870, I would think early 19th century as far as I know, but I'm no expert. And they were already choosing Hebrew names yes. in the early 19th century. But they were choosing names that were for them Jewish names. They didn't think of Hebrew, not Yiddish. They were not thinking in those terms. But yes, they wanted classic Jewish names instead of Tatelboim or, or something that would be from the trade. So yes, you have many of those. In the Harkavi family, a very prominent yeah, family yeah, from Navarro. Another, another Hebrew name. Hmm? Another Hebrew name. These are all... Yeah, yeah. But um, you have many debates about whether it's Hebrew origin. But yes, absolutely. Uh, Rabbi Baron has alluded to another very important fact that I was afraid to get into that the knowledge of reading Hebrew and Aramaic in Lithuania was much higher. So that the yeshivas had a much higher standard than the southern ones. In, 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 and even, even, even the people who were, who were not so learned studied Ein Yaakov there. Absolutely. You have the Ein Yaakov in Hebrew and in Yiddish. And we have them. Um, so the study, the love of study and learning, the Chev Mishnayis, that the Jew who could not understand the Gemara, the Talmud, would go to, would study every day or listen to it. A, a shia, a lesson in that. Um, Avram Mapu, he didn't create Hebrew, modern Hebrew prose, but he wrote the first um, uh, modern Hebrew novel. Uh, Hebrew prose was probably created by Mordechai Aaron Ginsburg before him. Anyway, um, what am I talking about here? That the thousand years of Ashkenazic civilization produced a vast rabbinic literature, but in different genres. We mentioned the Perush, the commentary, the super commentary, Teirish the Spanza literature, Shailas Hutchulis, um, Edicts, Kakonis uh, of a community. Um, and if there were poems, they tended to be liturgical poems uh, on, on God, on religion, or historic poems about um, an ordeal that the Jews of a city had undergone, like Vint, um, Frankfurt had Megillus Vintz. Uh, you didn't have the modern genres of the novel, the short story, the poem, the essay, and that. So these masculine enlightenment guys in the East, and here and only in Lithuania, started to produce novels in Hebrew. And Mapu, known by his enemies as Mapke, um, yes, um, from Slabotke, that was him, and that's this famous novel, A Harvest Sea on Love of Zion, Part 1, 1853, the first Hebrew novel um, in modern times. Modern Hebrew poetry, I would argue, was created by Odom HaKohen in Israeli universities, of course, Adam HaKohen, but not very many know that Odom, uh, the, the name Odom did not exist by and large. It wasn't a Jewish name. Uh, Odom here is an acronym of Avrom Dober Mechalishke, or Dom. He had lived in Mechalishke for a few years after he got married, so Berke Mechalishke, or Berke Apikeres. And there were a number of wealthy Jewish families in Vilna, the Klatschkos, the Kastanelenboygens. They started literary salons on the model of Polish and other languages. Yes, where there would be evenings where people would be encouraged to write. 
and he's, he wrote modern poems. His son, Michal, was a greater poet, died very young, sadly, of consumption, which is tuberculosis. Chichotzevet became known as the, the poet disease. The first major woman Hebrew writer, Zoyva Baron, is from Uzde, not far from Minsk, and uh, she made it to the early state of Israel where her talent was very widely, widely appreciated. You know. Modern Yiddish literature and Yiddish scholarship that people often associate with uh, Vilna, Lithuania. So in the first case, it's not true. Um, there, are, there were about 10,000 Yiddish writers between 1850 and 2000, and maybe a quarter came from the Lithuanian land. So it's a quarter is very important, it's proportionate, okay? But most of modern Yiddish literature was created in what is now Ukraine, and, and another free part in Poland. There were a few great Lithuanian writers, but far fewer in Yiddish literature. Nevertheless, the first great Yiddish writer um, of prose Mendele Moichas Foren was a Litvak who moved down south. So he moved from Kapule, today it's Kopel, yes. Uh, again, not far. Before the days of the border, I, I remember the early 1990s, he used to just drive there, okay? And um, in, in Soviet times, there was even a Mendele Museum, Pibor, uh, in Tuvalu, just on the Belarus. So anyway, um, he moved as a teenager um, to different places, ending up in Odessa, where his dialect changed. But he used his Litvak upbringing and the Ukrainian Yiddish of his later life to create the grammar of modern standard Yiddish. The gender system, the case system, it's, it's his work. It's now in big trouble, but that's another issue. Um, getting back to the Bund, that's a group of young Bundists. The, sec the gentleman in the white shirt, third from the right, is Max Weinrath, who started out as a Bundist. He was a Bundist all his life, but um, he was persuaded at this conference in 1913 that he was a genius at Yiddish linguistics, at the history of the Yiddish language, to give up politics. And the person who convinced him was the founder of ideological Yiddishism within the Jewish labor movement known as Esther. I don't know if he was uh, born in Minsk. Esther Frumkin or Malta Lipschitz. Um, other names she had, a number of marriages. Um, Esther Frumkin uh, like Taki Kremer, insisted that the Bund was wrong to accept Russian as a language of the Jewish people, and she was the most important founder of the idea that if you want a minority with equal rights, they have to have a school system of their own language. So around 1900, she wrote the first Yiddish grammar for schools. All of these people came from totally orthodox homes, in many cases, parents, grandparents, or rabbis. Okay? So they were revolutionaries who changed. So that's Esther Frumkin and Malta Lipschitz. So I'm going to talk for now about Yiddish linguistics, Yiddish scholarship. We're going to be in the 100th anniversary of Yibo, and I know there'll be a lot uh, uh, done and said about it. So Yiddish literature produced 10,000 writers uh, between 1850 and 2000, as I said, very formally. Yiddish linguistics, or the, the academic component of the Yiddish movement, Here's the big secret. It had a very tiny number of people who had a very big output that made a big, big, you know, historic impact. I have to say that because it's important. People think that before the war, everybody was evil, evil. No, 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 no. The majority of Jews in Vilna were simple religious Jews who had nothing to do with the modern movement. They, they would read a paper. They were not afraid of them. But, and then there was the Hebraist nationalist Zionist and the Yiddish socialist. Uh, both minorities. In 1913, Der Pinkis appeared. It was a Yiddish academic an anthology about the history of the Yiddish language and literature and folklore, entirely in Yiddish, published in folio form with two columns, like a rabbinic book. And as you notice, they used the Rashi, the rabbinic type font for their title. That didn't make everyone happy. Um, it was edited by Shmuel Chang, who became Shinniga. He regretted that choice of pseudonym when he got to America, but that again is another story. And the brilliant Ber Borachov established Yiddish studies here in Vilna in 1912, 1913 with this one book that starts with his brilliant essay, The Aims of Yiddish Philology, and it ends with the, the Library of the Yiddish Philology, 400 years of Yiddish linguistic research. Um, and um, 
the reason, and that's Baruch Hu. Uh, he's very famous now as the founder of labor Zionism, especially left-wing labor Zionism. But the Yiddishists who don't care about politics, he's the founder of academic Yiddish. So it's hard to, it's hard to exaggerate the emotive power that suddenly a stateless language with no academies and no money and no army and no navy could start um, producing academic work in the language itself, not about the language only. Um, this was possible because of two people who are not, probably not as famous as they should be. Boris Kletskin, okay, he was born in Harodnich, now in Belarus, and Tzemach Shabbat, the famous doctor uh, in Vilna, who was from an old Vilna family. All those Jewish names, you know, Shabbat, Mats, Kasper, they're all acronyms. So Shabbat is Shriach Bezdin, the emissary uh, of, of the court. Anyway, Kletskin came from a wealthy family, inherited a lot of money, and he used it to start the Kletskin Publishing House on Klein Stefan Das 23. Today it's at Miklos, in between it was Mala Stefanska, and the building still stands on the North West Yetzel Plan. He began in 1910 to publish in Yiddish exquisite volumes of high quality, not trash. Only high quality, whether it was novels or poetry and, and, or academia. So you can see by the guy's appearance what his politics and religious affiliation were. That's a Bundist revolutionary, okay, who had that kind of a beard, full hair but completely cut off here. That was the look with Alipa Shehitl. Okay, Tzemach Shabbat was, of course, the great do beloved doctor, legendary for traveling the villages and uh, treating poor children of every background. Um, and, um, but in his, his Yiddishism was a very strong part of his belief. He decided he would find for his daughter, Regina, a uh, husband who would be the greatest Yiddish linguist in Europe, and he brought Max Weinreich from Marburg after finding that Weinreich had done a doctorate on the history of the state. <coughs> All these famous people of Yivo, uh, Max Weiner, Zalman Reisen, uh, Zeli Hirsch Kalmanovich, none of them were born in Vilna. They all settled in Vilna around the years of the First World War, and they had they have several factories. They didn't go to Kovna because they were afraid of the Lithuanian language. That's the simple truth of that one. That one. They, there were these guys here. Uh, sorry, the previous guys. Uh, how do I do that? Have I lost my... Nope. No, 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 no. Sorry, I went to the end. Here, oh, here we are. Okay, here we are. Okay. Um, so um, there were these people financing top Yiddish scholarship. That was a second motive. And there were more. That Vilna was, from 1920, was open to Warsaw, Berlin, to all those direct train routes, all, all kinds of. They, Vilna and the prestige of Vilna, the rabbinic prestige, was for them the background for creating a little tiny circle of Yiddish study. Um, so Shabbat brought Weinreich and made him, uh, and, and eventually Shabbat is the real founder of Yivo because he gave the money for it here. It was, the idea was founded by Nochem Stich from Ukraine who was living in Berlin, but that's a topic for next year. Um, okay, so that's the Weinreich, that's Zalman Reisen and Max Weinreich, and the first 10 years they published a dozen or so massive big volumes of scholarship that brought together religious writers, secular writers, non-Jewish writers, but in Yiddish, and in a new academic style of Yiddish. Um, okay, um, finally, there's a maverick streak of Litvak who have become part of the law, Yosher Mekandia, or Yosher of Krik, or Joseph Solomon Del Medigo, in other words, he was a doctor. He lived in the 1620s here. He wrote a reply to the Parites, the Paraim, uh, Isaac of, of Troch, um, one of the most amazing is Solomon Maimon, Shlema Maimon, who's known in, he's known for philosophy, he's known, he's not, not known anymore. Um, the, the pupil of, well, he, he was in touch with Kant, who said that Maimon is the only guy who understands me. Anyhow, he was a Litvak born in Yezrich, and um, very tumultuous life. In addition to his brilliant philosophic papers, of which I didn't understand one word, he wrote an uh, autobiography that translated into at least a dozen languages, including English, German, Russian. Um, uh, his autobiography is sensational. Firstly, it's all about his sexual adventures and misadventure, and his disdain for traditional religious Jews, both Misnabdin, but especially Hasidim. 
So many of our pictures of the sites, the early sites between Nostalgia and Castilian, uh, a little bit east of the Vilna area, uh, but still in, in Vilna province, are in that book by Schleimer Meinem. And of course, the creator of Esperanto, who was born in a literary city called, uh, you know, uh, Kovna in some versions, but known from Bialystok as the center. And he, um, the creator of Esperanto, it's not very well known. He wrote a Yiddish grammar. And in 1909, under the pseudonym Dr. X, he published in Vilna a sensational pamphlet with an idea that brought together the Jews of every tribe against him. He proposed, are you ready? Getting rid of the Hebrew and the Jewish alphabet and devising a Latin alphabet to make Yiddish a European language. And when he was challenged, but which dialect would it be based on? He said, of course, the Lithuanian, because it's the only correct one. So that's the same Zamenhof Hosea. Okay, 1900, the word, there were three different spellings and concepts of Lipe. It had always been spelt in traditional works for hundreds of years with an Aleph, uh, officially Lipe, but informally Lipe. Uh, but from around 1900, the Yiddishist and Hebraist wanted their spelling to reflect their movement. So the Yiddishist insisted on Lipe, with the I and that's E, to make the informal pronunciation formal. And the Hebraists who were beginning to aspire to so-called Sephardic, to Middle Eastern Hebrew, lita, and wanted the ah, they spelt it with a he. And you find some fascinating things on the title page of books. Okay, in the interwar years, for the first time the Litovs were dispersed in the sense that in the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, and after the union with Poland in the 16th century in the Grand Duchy of Lithuania and the Kingdom of Poland, and then in the Tsarist Empire, in all these cases, the Litvaks were more or less in one country. Okay? And after the First World War, a Litvak in Riga is suddenly a citizen of Latvia. Litvak in Kovna is a citizen of Lithuania, a citizen in Vilna, a citizen of Poland, and, um, and if he's in uh, Minsk, he's in the Belarusian uh, Soviet Republic. If he's in Chernigov, Chernigov, he's in the Ukrainian Republic, and that led to many um, people not being comfortable with the word Litva. I mean, if you take the great Yiddish poets of Vilna in the, in the 20s, they may have been loyal citizens of the Polish Republic, but in their Yiddish writing, it could only be Litva, because Poland was, Poland was completely different. So the great Kulbach in his poem Vilna, yes, you, uh, you are a amulet inscribed in deep in Lithuania, in Litva, okay? Um, in the lands of emigration, there was a lot of humor, Litvak and Galiciana. We Litvaks like to call all the southerners Galiciana. It's not accurate. Galicia, 1815, the Congress of Vienna. Galicia itself had two Yiddish dialects, half of it is Polish, half of it is Ukrainian. So Litvak and Galiciana became part of vaudeville and sometimes cheap, well, not deep Jewish humor, and you have all the jokes and skits about mixed marriages. I am a Litvak and she is a Glitz, and, and, and so on. But it's basically a north-south division, if you want to talk about it more objectively. In the major, what did I? Uh, so after the Holocaust, in, in, here in the historic homeland, the, the Soviet oppression left really no opportunity for cultural or religious continuity. In Yiddish literature, a very few writers preserved for the generations the lives of their youth. Chaim Grada, Avram Kartinovitz, Zalman Schneer, Avram Sutva, and others. Okay, they're, not all, they're all not that famous. The whole literature called Yisko books, commemoration books, um, is a very, very rich literature of memoirs, although very often not professionally uh, written or edited. There's Beryl Kagan's Encyclopedia of, Yiddish, of Jewish Towns in Lithuania, covering only the territory of the Republic of Interwar Lithuania. Um, and the Lithuanian translation is almost complete, but sadly has not appeared yet. I hope it will, it will come out. And we're still working to find many who have an English translation. His daughter is, is very active on that. Um, it, needs oh, it needs editing. Hmm? It needs editing, as you know. Bell Yeah, it is a You mean areas or? Because it's a one. Yeah, it's a one person. Uh, it, yeah. Many of these efforts are one man, one woman shows. This is true. And this is part of a bigger issue, I think, that the whole East European Jewish civilization 
did not become the mainstream of Jewish life in America or in Canada, in the, for, for the majority in England and so on. Okay, the, the attachment to the state of Israel in modern Hebrew, the attachment to modern religious movements in America and elsewhere, um, but a very important continuity are the literature, yeshivas, Mir, Ponovich, Tells, Baranovich, Lakewood, Gateshead. Um, so these are the great academies today, and we're very honored to have here the Rosh Yeshiva, the head of Baranovich Yeshiva in Jerusalem, whose father, grandfather, and ancestors led the Baranovich Yeshiva. You may not know that Baron comes from Baranovich, but don't tell him I told you. Um, in Israel, many, many foreign people are shocked. Galitaim, Galitaim. So what does Litaim mean? It can be your Haredi. Haredi means more religious than modern Orthodox. You don't wear the little kippah suruga with the bobby pin. You wear a proper yarmulke. Ashkenazic, Haredi, not Sephardic, minus Hasidic, okay? Not always literally derived, but following various traditions. And a few years ago, I visited my Hasidic friends in Monsey, New York, and they told me there's a whole street of literature. I said, literature, I want to meet them. No, I met a bunch of Americans who speak English with a bit of yeshivish mixed in, you know. No, that was a chilek in the opinion, so what am I going to do? But they didn't know where Lithuania was. They didn't know where their ancestral town was today, but they're the literature, they're non-Hasidic um, and a little more religious than modern Orthodox, sometimes much more religious. Than but, um, I, have, I have a better story for this. Okay. I just met a... Uh, Can everybody hear? Maybe stand up. And, well, yeah. Schmidt, my wife, I'll tell you a lot of this. So we met in Poland a girl... Can from, everyone hear? A girl from Ukraine, a non-Jewish girl, wants to become Jewish. Oh, yeah. and she's for I'll years, talk about it. She's yeah. a few years already working and studying and trying to become Jewish. And when she met us, and after she started a few conversations, she wanted to know, she wanted only Litvish. Mimi? She's not Jewish. She wanted, yeah, but Mimi she wanted to become Jewish, but she wanted to make sure that she joins only the oh, Litvish sect. She found the right time. Yeah. <laughs> she wants, she asked, I think, Hasidim, I think she wants a, a non Jewish Ukrainian woman. She wants to be only Litvish. Where in Ukraine? Uh, she came from the south, but she spent the... Uh, the southeast had that Litvish area, Chernigo, if you know. <laughs> no, I don't no, think no, it's today. That okay, good. Right. No, the Litvish is much more attractive. It's much more yeah. Okay. okay. Um, and in Israel, there's the Degel Hatola party, and Rabbi Baron can tell you in the que if there's a question later, much, much more than me. Um, internationally, if you want to speak ethnographically, Chabad, Lubavitch, or Litva. They are from the east of Lithuania. Vitebsk, Molev, Molev, Mohilov, um, okay, Homle, Gomel. Um, and so all the rabbis we've been privileged to know in the last decades here are Litvaks of one kind or another, the point being that there are many different kinds of religious Litvaks outside all the other non-religious versions we spoke about, okay? Um, so many of you know Rabbi Pfeffer, who on his father's side comes from a long line of, of uh, Lithuanian rabbis, on his mother from very mother's side from famous Hungarian rabbis. Um, then you have perhaps some of you remember Rabbi Burstein, who was born in St. Petersburg and only became Orthodox late in life, but identifies with Litaim, in other words, uh, the Lithuanian religious tradition. Okay, and of course you know Rabbi Prinsky, who as a Chabadnik speaks lovely Lithuanian Yiddish. So they're all Litvaks. And now we have Rabbi Baron. For the first time, we have a Rosh Yeshiva from, you know, from a long line of heads of Yeshiva. No, in modern Lithuania, there have been many controversial projects about Litva culture, many lively discussions. This week, I got attacked for writing a too positive review of the wonderful new museum on, on Atilamo, the Museum of Litva Identity. It's on Barbara Kirschen Black Gimlet's um, uh, Facebook page. She's the director of Polin. Warsaw. So Adam, Adam Sachs, I think, American scholar, wrote a very scathing review. So you, you can read that debate. He talks about appropriation of the word Litva. I remember from years ago, a Litva foundation was founded by someone. When it didn't go well, he wrote an essay committee. I mean, you find all kinds of uses. Okay? Um, then you also find very many um, controversial Jewish usages. For example, the official Jewish community today, what is it? The Lithuanian Jewish, parenthesis, Litvak community. Now, I don't think that's right. 
uh, for example, as I, uh, I'm thinking of dear Liana, uh, yes, and her sister Rika, I remember very well your dear grandfather, who used to come to our weekly Yiddish reading circle that we did for 21 years, and when we read Shalom Aleichem, we wanted you singing it to us. And he wasn't a Litzvah, and he's no less a member of the Jewish community here, you know. So, again, it's a, it can be controversial in that. And then you have, all over the place, the Litzvahness of the Three Stooges, Woody Allen, and say, oh, they're Litzvah. So somebody born in America, where parents and grandparents came from six different cities in Eastern Europe, it's appropriation of Litzvah. Has anyone ever visited the American consulate in town? No. No, the American consulate here in the, on, in the, on the grounds of the American embassy, you're not allowed to take pictures there, but you're allowed to stand and say, write it all down. It has, a, it, for at least 15 years, it's had an exhibition, Lithuanian Americans, okay? And among the Lithuanian Americans are the Three Stooges, okay? The, the famous American comedy group. One was born in Philadelphia, I think one was born in Hackenstein, Esmir Litvakis, but then. And you have all kinds of trivialization, Litvak hats and Litvak toys and Litvak music. And we come to the point of who is today a Litvak. In one sense, the strictest sense, it's only people who came to maturity before the Holocaust and grew up in the Yiddish-speaking civilization of Lithuania. Now, I have, this is a very painful point for Litvaks. We Litvaks, and Litvaks did not recreate that civilization totally the way Hasidim did. You can walk through streets of Barakwak and Stamford Hill and one thing, all in Yiddish, in a very deep Yiddish, different clothing, different mindset, a different ethnic group. Um, so, people who came to that maturity before 1941 are not going to be very young today. We recently lost here uh, Fania Yochalis Brantovsky at the age of 102, but when someone is the last Mohican, she was the last to have been educated in the secular schools, including Sofia Gurevich's magnificent gymnasia on Makova, uh, Aguono, I think it is today. Um, in the rabbinic world, the loss of Rabbi Chaim Kanievsky and Gershon Edelstein in the last years, also the loss of among the very last who came to maturity before the Holocaust. That doesn't mean that l later people are not Litvaks, but it's different. Okay? Um, then you have anybody who's a follower of Lithuanian Orthodox Judaism, and in many environments, Orthodox, a little Haredi, but, um, non Hasidic plus Ashkenazi, and th that identification. Okay? Then you have the last generation of us quickly yeah, aging. By the way, I yeah. estimate it's annoying to people. I think you're right. It's, yeah. it's conservatively yeah. annoying. It, yeah. somewhere, Rabbi Barrett, that's an somewhere important. Somewhere between one and two million. No, right. Nobody really, even. Okay. It's, it's like. like but it's a very important point. Yeah. It's this, a this, this is people who identify yeah. as Lithuanians. I'm saying these people right. have a feeling, a right. will for, for Lithuania. And that's the last line here our freedom to self-identify. Rabbi Varen has just made the point that there are at least, let's call it a million, there may be more, but at least a million living human beings in the world who identify themselves in, with one of the words, Lithuanian, Litvish, Litvak, whatever, with one of those words, Lithuanian probably, Lithuanian in English and Litvak in Hebrew, not the word Litvak or Litvish necessarily because Yiddish is very weak in most of these communities, but they identify with Lithuanian Jews. So that's a million people in the world, whereas those of us for whom Lithuanian Jewish culture is, you know, a topic, we are a tiny, tiny group of people, and we have to be honest about that, that it is the religious um, Litvak communities that are the true continuity because they have real communities, and that are there still briska who speak Yiddish in Asia. There's, there's still groups. There's still groups that speak Yiddish. There are many the more groups. groups the, that, two, the two yeah. uh, rabbis in, in uh, of uh, Slobodka. Slobodka. Where Moshe Hill Hirsch and Rabdov Land does perfect right. Litvish Yiddish. Per perfect li perfect but Litvish their children Yiddish. won't speak Litvish Yiddish. Because they don't speak it at home as a religious language, the way Hasidim did. That's a difference. In, so, but um, I meet very, uh, where I live part of the year in North Wales, I meet very many Orthodox Jewish visitors to the seaside because rabbis of all persuasions decree that North Wales is the only kosher seaside they're allowed to go to, they're least likely to see immodestly clad young women. So I have a, a ball in the summer when there are Hasidim and Satma, and Litvak has come from Gateshead, and many tell me, no, they don't speak Yiddish, but they can follow a lesson in Yiddish. 
They could even speak Yiddish about the page of the Gemara, but they can't have a conversation. They said, they said the, the Shiloh must still learn uh, Yiddish. Some, some. It's, it's America, but it's an American idea. Yeah, you're right. Yiddish. 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 No, but, so, but what, uh, yeah, so uh, this is a, the, the only societally honest continuum here. But this is all right. pure Yiddish, yes. the, the, right. the Shiorim of all these Yiddish. Shiorim, but families of the next generation, if no, you don't speak it, if you don't speak it at home, families, or some families of yeah. the I want to mention one of my newfound friends, Yenison, he spells it Yenison, Y-E-Y-N-E-S-N, <laughs> Felendler, who lives in Kiryat Sefer in Israel, who's the most brilliant young philologist of Litvish Yiddish. Okay? Yeah. Sorry? What's his name? Fellendler. Fellendler? Fel, it comes from Fellendler, um, a uh, fur uh, merchant, but it's without the H. I'm struggling with my father. Fellendler. I have my father's lectures in Yiddish. You shouldn't struggle. Which, which you should I, be a machai. Well, need, need, need oh, he's, he is your man now. He listens to, <laughs> he knows all of Rabbi Pinchas' tapes, tapes by heart. Okay, um, so th there are many different definitions. Speakers of Litvish Yiddish are Litvakers, descendants and others. We in Vilnius have met all kinds of American Jews. I'm a Litvak. Why are you a Litvak? I want to be a Litvak. Okay, okay. So self-identification and the right to be whatever you want to be. Um, who is not confident with the word, uh, comfortable with the word Litva? Chabad and other Lithuanian Hasidim. Okay, because for them, Litvak often means misnagged. They interpret it. Not always. When it comes to things here, they might be able to, you know, see it differently. Jews in the interwar republics, we discussed. Those in the 19th century editions, we discussed that earlier too, around Kherson and Poltave, where they spoke Litvish but were not Litvaks. And certain groups even going way back, like in Kurland, okay, Western Latvia, where many of the Jewish families were German speaking. I remember Salvas Bajinis and I once went on an expedition to Western Latvia. We came to Goldingen, today Kuldiga, Max Weinrath's birth town, and Zelig Hirschkalmanovitz's birth town. So there were no living Jews left. We went to the cemetery. Half the cemetery were German Jewish gravestones in modern Hebrew, and the other half were classic Litvish gravestones with all the traditional. Hebrew words, the, the abbreviations, you could see it's two different Jewish cultures in the two parts of the cemetery. The word for died is yonav, yotzo nishmosoi v'tayra, but it was read yonav like the past tense of a Hebrew verb. The yonav, kokov gimel. So anyway, they were not exactly com comfortable with it, and they were. Um, my own projects include the Lithuanian Yiddish video archive, all free on YouTube. 760 videos um, so far, and we hope to digitize another 760. Uh, and uh, we, that we, when we do, we put them online free, but no translations, no index, that'll be done by someone after me. My worry is uh, not getting them up in my lifetime, so that's that. I'm working on the Yiddish Cultural Dictionary, which has been accused of pro lithuanian bias by my many colleagues in New York, and there are books online. And those are some maps, but I, I won't go into them. Uh, I'll just mention what I was doing. I found a lady who was born in Chernobyl and after the atomic disaster lived in another town, but she was able to tell me the towns that spoke the special dialect of Chernobyl Yiddish and prayed in Chernobyl Hebrew. It's like Litvish, except every U is an E. Borich, not Boruch and not Burich. So that was Chernobyl. When I went to the Chernobyl Floyds in Borough Park, the oldest man there didn't speak it, but he knew about it. Okay, Chernobyl. Zame. I uh, used to go every Sunday to see Freda Yokelovich in Yegnevitsky in, in Kovna. She had been born in Kul, Kule, and uh, she wrote for me the 14 towns in, in interwar Lithuania, that's the green area, where, it was, uh, where the special dialect of Zame was still spoken, and she had it. The border of Lita and Reisen, I have seen bitter fistfights of it. I'm from Lita, you're from Reisen. Um, I once went to a book launch. My late friend, Professor Gershon Weiner, um, uh, for the, the village of the town of Wies, today it's in Belarus, and it said Vilna Gubernia. And I didn't want to make trouble. Sometimes it happens to me. I raised my hand and I said, according, this was in Kovna Gubernia. It was closer to Vilna, but Kovna Gubernia had that little pump. No, it's impossible. We're from Vilna Gubernia. 
Okay, now any questions, arguments, please feel free to... Uh, yes, sir. I have some questions. Please, maybe stand up or... Probably shows my low level of the education. I understand that in general Hebrew language is much older than Yiddish. Yes. 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 How would it happen that the Jewish nation, the people leaving their country and coming to Europe, started to use, in generally, the different language? Of course, as you show in your map, in different areas influenced by the local languages, got getting the different dialects of the Yiddish, mm -hmm. how it happened. Okay. And, uh, mm -hmm. and another, also very stupid, the letters are used in Hebrew and in Yiddish. Yes. Is the same or not? Yeah. It's, okay, I'll, the second question is easier, so I'll start with it. It's the, the right term is the Jewish alpha. The Jewish alphabet is used for Hebrew, for Ladino Judesmo, for Aramaic, for Yiddish. It's used in different ways, okay? So um, a, an ancient Semitic languages have only consonants, not vowels. So uh, Yiddish used consonants that were no longer consonants as vowels. Ayin became E, eh, Aleph became A, and O. So to answer your question, and the physical form you see today of Hebrew letters, that's called Assyrian script. South Ashuri that the Jews adopted after their exile in Babylonia in 586 BC. When they find ancient papyruses in, in Israel and they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's the ancient Hebrew alphabet, Paleo Hebrew, completely different. None of us can read it without learning, okay? Ayin is a circle, completely different. So that's the form of the letter. But these are all forms of the ancient Semitic alphabet, sometimes called the Phoenician alphabet, uh, alphabet that gave rise to the Greek alphabet. Uh, you have many words, in Aleph, Alpha, Bet, Beta, you know, and, you, and this is a little bit perhaps exaggerated, but, but some people still see in the forms the ancient Cuneiform form that it comes from, that Aleph meant an ox, okay, in an ancient Aramaic dialect, and it looks a little like an ox. Bays, Bet, Bayat meant a house. Gimel meant a camel, Dalit meant a door, Ayan meant an eye, Resh meant a head. Anyway, so that's the ancient Semitic alphabet, um, and it's used in different ways. About the history of Jewish languages. So, the Hebrew in the Bible is, is a special Israelite language based on the Canaanite dialect that the settlers from um, the Aramaic-speaking countries found, uh, and the language they brought with them, okay, from Babylonia. So Abraham, the, the classic biblical tale is correct in the sense that there was a tribe that moved to Israel, Palestine, the Holy Land, and they developed the Hebrew language and it reached great literary heights at the 8th, the 9th, 8th, 7th century BC in the books of the prophets of the Bible. After 586 BC, when Jerusalem fell and the temple was burned and the Jews were exiled, Hebrew was probably never again a spoken language. That's not popular to say because our whole Judaism today is Hebrew centric. So you'll find other people who say it was spoken in, in, uh, uh, in Christ's time. It wasn't. The Jews developed their second great language, Jewish Aramaic, which is based on Babylonian Aramaic, but with a very big Hebrew component. Okay. So let's say Pesach. Pesach in the Bible is Passover, among other things, and in the Aramaic language it's Pascha. And so in the Talmud, Pascha. Uh, to mean the Passover. But in Yiddish, the, the, the Aramaic and the Hebrew word, they were incorporated into Yiddish, but with a difference. Pesach meant the Jewish Passover, and Pascha means Easter. So Pascha is the Yiddish word for Easter. So there's the Hebrew period, then the Aramaic period, and then the Yiddish period. So Yiddish developed on the banks of the Rhine and the Danube in Ashkenaz, based largely on medieval German dialects, but it was immediately combined with Hebrew and Aramaic in an exact way, not always according to logic. The Hebrew word, the Yiddish word, sorry, for sun is bizun, okay? And the Yiddish word for moon is bilevon, okay? Uh, you can't do it the other way. If you say mon for moon, okay, and shemesh for, for sun, you're not talking Yiddish. You're combining Hebrew and German. So there was a, a, a fusion of Indo of European Germanic with Semitic, and that became Yiddish over the last thousand years. So in different periods. So the whole survival of the Jewish people after exile, okay, is a whole either miracle or crazy story or whatever you want to call it. 
but Yiddish became the language of the Ashkenazi tribe of Jews. While maintaining Hebrew and Aramaic for sacred study and reading and for uh, writing new books. And but yeah. the reasons why the new language was developed instead of the old? The old was no longer spoken. In other words, these are historic developments. Nobody makes it, nobody can, except for one Ben Yehuda, the late Dr. Perelman, who changed his name. It's very rare in world history that someone decides to start speaking something that nobody speaks. Okay? I read books on linguistics where they say this, I read everybody who's the only person in the world history who pulled it off. I don't think it's that big a miracle because the Litvak knew so much Hebrew that it wasn't that hard. It wasn't that. But be that as it may, languages develop. Okay? You can look at the relationship of Lithuanian and Latvian, and then you can come to all sorts of conclusions. But nobody decided I'm going to speak a different kind of Baltic than you. Okay? There was a geographic difference, cultural difference, different history, and it's like a human being that develops and has its experiences. In Eastern Europe, Yiddish, has, uh, perhaps we can have another evening on Yiddish, it's not today's topic, but in Eastern Europe, Yiddish required the Slavic component, and so uh, East European Yiddish has. And again, oh no, no, change his mind. Yes, you won't change your mind. You're a little like a mind. First, I wanted to thank you for not at all. And uh, my question uh, is about your research methods. You spoke a little bit about how you search for speakers of Yiddish. Could you perhaps say a bit more about this process? Okay. Um, so, I guess when I was doing my BA in linguistics in, in, at Yiddish at Columbia University, I was very jealous of the other kids who were studying the history of Spanish or Italian or German. They would go for the summer to Italy and they would look for the last speaker in the mountains. And everybody told me that after the Nazis came to the Soviets and you can't go there anyway if the Soviet Union, forget it. So, um, if I can give this one example, when I was a young student in New York, I put an uh, ad in the Yiddish paper looking for Litvaks born in the towns where, of the Shemaitiya, Zana. Okay, I didn't find one who spoke it because in America it was so assimilated, they were embarrassed about the funny dialect that they lost it. In 1990, I came for the first time, spent a month in Vilna from uh, uh, December 90 to uh, January 91, and I was thrilled to find hundreds of speakers of every kind of Yiddish. Then, in 1992, I was on another personal trip in the town of Svir, uh, not far from here, looking for my great-grandmother's grave because my father had written a book in her name. And um, in, in the book, she comes to his dreams in New York and dictates the book. It's a different story. But when we found her grave in one week, and I had already two guys with me, uh, Piotr Ivanov or Petra Ivanova from Ignalina and the late Zixi Shapiro of uh, Pabraga. We had a whole week on our hands. So I said, let's start looking around. We went to Smalgon and we went to Oshmina and we went to Bar In every town, I found at least one amazing person or family who still spoke the local And that was when it became a goal of my life to take as much as I can before they disappear because they were then very old understood people are not forever, not them and not me. So my late mother never forgave me in 1999 when I was a visiting professor at Yale and I turned down that 10 years because I had an invitation to come here and I could continue my practice. I could go every weekend uh, to look, you know. Anyway, so it's, the, it's an um, a audio and video archive of the last spoken Yiddish in the Lithuanian land and that is the map in a way that corresponds to these 30 years in a sense. Yes? I want to ask you from the beginning, when you started the first slide, yes. and after you talk about what uh, it was in America when you were a child, and it was Polish environments around you. My question, your opinion about the Litvaks and Litvakes in Polish, is dialect or something else? Because if there are sound in the language of the Slavonic, so it's all prefix, I'm sorry, I'm not grammar. And uh, it's, it's put the impact on the, on the language. What is your opinion? Right. Lit or Vak? Oh, oh, okay, I see. Riva, Riva. So in, 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 Yiddish, in Yiddish itself, yeah. 
the word arose as an insult, litzvak, okay? Yeah. And as a suffix, it's always a pejorative in English, as I mentioned before, polyak, tuak, pakenimut, and words that I would never mention in front of such an elegant audience. And by changing it to litzvak, it became Hamish, it became not insulting. Uh, when? We, when don't know, we, we don't know. In fact, our first attestations in text are from the 18th century. One of the earliest rabbinic uses of the word Litva is about Shnei Azalman from the Adi. It's what the Ukrainian, his Ukrainian teachers called him when they were not happy with him. This Litva come up more. Um, but um, it could come from the time of the split of 1623 of the Va'ad Litov from the Council of the Four Lands. That's point one. But there's another interesting point. When we traveled in Ukraine, we found that in Ukraine, um, Litva just didn't come out of the mouth properly because there's Litva where it's an insult. So it became Litvik. Erva Litvik. Okay? By the way, there's a super insulting form that is even without the change that you're about to really stress, Lutvak. So Lutvak is called a hypercorrection. We say kumen, they say kimen. We say purim, they say pirim. So they they make they say wherever, even where it's e everywhere, they will say litvak says u. So lutvak is one of the insults of Polish Jews against us. But we litvaks get our revenge very quickly. In our dialect, the Polish Jews are called Polish. So we call them Polish, even though in that word it's not Polish. Um, so you have linguistic humor and irony that then enters the dialect and, and, is, uh, and people don't often think of it until it's studied hundreds of years later. Great, anyone else who has not yet spoken and feel free to disagree with anything? No? No, okay, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. for um, being here with us, for your really interesting and so engaging uh, lecture. It, it was a big honor to have you here. Honor to be and here. I already marked, you know, um, other evenings mentioned. <coughs> and you will then talk about Kabbalah and Hebrew and Yiddish languages. So we will be, so we will be <laughs> looking for if, those. If, uh, he's a little <laughs> but if you could persuade Rabbi Baron to do it, yeah. it would be a fantastic achievement. A Litvak Rosh, a Litvish Rosh Yeshiva of the Baranovich. Uh, I leave it to the professor. I did mine. We have mine so good. So we'll set a meeting and we'll, we'll decide. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you.